Hey, welcome everybody. My name is Timothy Gager and welcome to Virtual Thursday's Dire Literary Series. And tonight my uh, guest is uh, Jenna Lee. And uh, what we are going to do is I'll show you her bio. Let's see if I can not mess this up. And so it's already starting out great. Yeah, I'm, I'm the technology wizard of Dedham, Massachusetts. All right, there it is. Jenna Lee is a Minnesota-born daughter of Vietnamese refugees. She earned her BA in mathematics before obtaining her MD and has worked as a physician and educated in the in the Bronx and Lebanon, New Hampshire. Six, six Rivers, uh, New York Quarterly Books, her first full-length poetry collection was a small press distribution poetry bestseller. Her second full-length collection, A History of the Cetacean, Cetacean. Cetacean. American Diaspora from Indolent Books, uh, won second place in the 2017 Elgin Awards. And her latest book, which she's going to read from tonight, Manatee Lagoon, came out last October. And it's not the only thing that came out last October. Um, but and there she is. And that looks like the New York Poetry Festival, but I'm not quite sure. So it is. anyway. Yeah. It's funny. It looks the same every year, right? That was a, that's actually a few years. That's actually a few years back in my, in my younger years. <laughs> but yeah, thanks so much for having me. And thanks everyone for being here. Um, so like Timothy said, I'm going to be reading from my latest book, Manatee Lagoon, um, which just came out in the fall uh, from, from Acre Books. And like Timothy said, it's not the only thing to come out. Um, I, it came out around the same time I had my had my baby daughter. So it's uh, the lesser of my two children from the from the fall. Oh, Jenna, that's wonderful. I'll be quiet. It's Sarah <laughs> Sarai, so nice to see you. Hi, so nice to see you, Sarah. Okay, so I'm gonna read some poems from this book. Um, so I'm gonna start, um, since I'm meeting many of you for the first time, I'm gonna start with a poem called How We Met. I want to confess everything about that cow behind the fence at whose sight I blurted a horse so that I then had to pretend it was a horse I saw. What fibs we tell to gloss over the fact God's fly is always down. I looked the other way to spare him unease. That's how I met your blue eyes across the cocktail lounge. It's how I met everyone I've ever met. All right, so um, a lot of the poems are poems of place from different places. And, you know, with Timothy and some other people here, I know being based in New England, I thought I'd read a couple of my New England poems. So this one is called Dispatch from Hanover, New Hampshire, which is uh, where I lived for about three years. Um, and I lived there uh, about 2016 to 2019. So uh, there's some reference to current events, including the election of uh, the president who was the president right before this one, who's unnamed in the poem, but who is sort of the presence in it. So this is a dispatch from Hanover, New Hampshire. One, mid-February here, the president inaugurated three short weeks ago, just turned the EPA's reins over to a climate change denier, Salon laments. Today's high, 49 degrees, Ice sculptures across the Dartmouth green are melting fast, limbs snapping off and shattering. Funny that when temps start rising, ice gets cloudy colored, as if it thinks like some postmodern writers, opaqueness has the power to thwart extinction. Just yesterday, upon this chiseled griffin's outstretched right paw, there perched an owl of ice. Two, at three years old, I had a vivid nightmare. My mom was standing at her bedroom window, lifting the gauzy curtain with one hand so she could see. The lamp cast golden light where she lingered on that crisp midwinter evening, excitedly calling me to come and look. You won't believe this. Right here on our block, a big ice sculpture, a miracle all gleaming beneath the bottom's porch lights. Wrapped, she stared. But I was mad at her, some childish snit, and feigned I did not hear her, 
dragged my feet. And when I relented, there was nothing there. So this is another uh, uh, New England poem, uh, sort of a, this, this one's a Vermont poem. And it's called, Please Don't Tell Me How the Story Ends. A Vermont man, rural, lacerated his knee with a chainsaw doing tree work one summer. The wound festered, not angrily, but with a slow simmering puzzlement. This lasted years. One day he fingered it, felt something hard inside, pulled out a shiny piece of glass. Another time he pulled a blade of grass out of it, then a whole maple leaf, so perfect it filled Canadian flag makers with envy. Started feeling mighty proud of himself, like King Arthur when he made that stone belch up a sword, began pulling bigger and bigger things out of his knee, a dime, a dollar bill, a bandana, a quail's egg, and the quail hatched too. He got to calling himself the wizard, made the circuit of local festivals, state fairs. Now you'd think the story ends someplace bad, a psych ward, OR, or early grave, a wimpled lady shoveling dirt on a corpse that died of three parts delusion, one part gangrene. But I think the times have just gotten to you. The pessimists opining on TV have dragged you down to their level. That Vermonter, he's still making the rounds, still finding 7-Eleven receipts, perfectly folded roadmaps, and poetry broadsheets tied with slim blue ribbons in his knee. Sometimes butterflies come foaming out, five or six at once, beating lavender wings. Um, so I'm gonna read this one. This is a sort of a villanelle or a variation on the villanelle form. Um, it's called The Reader. The reader, don't date a lot of boys. It's better far to marry your first love like I did, the gray haired woman said. The Tina girl scoffed at this advice. She longed to carry out what she thought to be a full life, rich with a varied experience, like in the novels she had read. And so she dated many boys and did not marry at all and sad guitarists sang her wild, unwary heart, her tangled hair, her hot, impulsive head. The girl basked in their singing and went on to carry on love affairs whose bitterness was legendary that ended in glass shards and horse heads left in beds. And when she'd had her fill, she thought, at last she would marry. Her wedded life and childbirth too have literary worth featuring in many novels, central threads. And so she found a husband who was proud to carry into their house his bride, whose interplanetary, picaresque past just proved she tried and risked and bled. They raised a girl and boy, and they stayed happily married. She never spoke of that one throbbing scar she carried. So. I'm going to read a, a sort of it's a love poem at the same time. It's also a, a frastic poem about a about a painting. Um, so the painting is called Venus Frigida, which is the name of the painting. Um, and I'll, I'll just read it and you'll see how it goes. Venus Frigida, which means the frozen Venus. The frozen Venus is the image caption, an homage to the jaundiced Latin maxim that all love grows cold when food and drink are absent. Depicted in a sickly green lit landscape, the fair flanked goddess squats on bald red fabric and hugs her wind and nipped trunk to fend off gangrene from frostbite. While her son emits a rattly cough in the vicinity of her waxen knees. She pointedly ignores a goat eared man beast, an umber muscled satyr hovering blackly mere inches from the pear, a bulging basket on his arm. I don't buy this for a fraction of a second. I've been cold before. 
If Madame Venus were really cold, she would grab that damask beneath her hawk and wrap it round her fat knobbed back. I've been cold. If I were in this tableau, I'd grab pale Cupid, press him to my memories, absorbing all his heat. Good Lord, I'd gladly tackle that brown goat man himself and wrestle him to the dirt. That Terence, he was a hack. If love is great enough, it will conquer. So come back. I think that's my Timothy. Is that, is that that's good for seven? I, I can read it. What, what do you think? Up to you. Um, we're just one more. Uh, I'm ready. I'm ready to hear another one. All right. So um, I'm going to read a, this is a sonnet. Um, yeah. So this is a sonnet I wrote short, uh, a few years ago, uh, shortly after uh, Kate Spade, the handbag designer, passed away. Um, and it made me think of this memory. So it's a memory of growing up and it's called Purses. Purses. When our quiz bowl team of 18 year olds snagged a berth of the finals held in New York City, my small town of Minnesotan brain cells dizzied. At last, I'd be someplace that mattered. Swag was my teammate Anne's fixation. Knock off bags peddled in Chinatown fixed with the glitzy Kate Spade labels. Anna bought a sack of six, and then she forgot it on the airport, airport shuttle's shag seats. Someone swiped it within minutes. Kate, I learned a fact of womanhood that year. Even we knock off girls, cheap, desperate to look like someone else, to imitate a finer woman, have our value. We're wanted wanted until we disappear. Thanks. Thank you, Jenna. And those were from Manatee Lagoon, her uh, book that came out last October. So let me ask you a few questions and I'd really love to talk to you. Sure, um, yeah. The uh, You introduced a lot of your poems you read earlier in this set about this is a New Hampshire poem, this is a Boston mm -hmm. poem, but even Manatee Lagoon is a place, a lagoon in Florida. So yeah. the sense of place, why do you think you relate so much to location? Um, that's a good question. Uh, yeah, so I was always, when I was growing up, I was like the one kid who never moved. Like uh, all the other kids would be like, you know, I, I lived in one house basically until I was like grown up. So I guess I always, it, it, yeah. So I, I've always felt, I guess, a, a tie to whatever, whatever place I'm at. And I've always had a relationship to place that was, kind of partly a real relationship, but also kind of a fantasy relationship. I think when I was growing up, I kind of wished I was one of those kids who had traveled around and been everywhere. So I'd always be kind of fantasizing what this place was like or what that place was like without really having any idea what any of those places felt like at all. So every time I've moved someplace new, you know, in my growing up life, I've always been kind of hungry to like absorb what, what, what that place is really like compared to like how I see it in my head, which is often wildly, wildly inaccurate. So a lot of my poems have been like that, um, just like this hunger to, absorb the place I'm in. And I think also, yeah, you know, my parents are, are, are refugees or immigrants. And so I've always, I've always felt kind of like never really, never 100% connected to the place I'm in. I've always felt like, you know, that's not really where my roots are, even, even where in Minnesota, where I grew up. So I, I think that sort of also feeds into the way I relate to place. I kind of, I kind of desperately long to belong to it, but at the same time, like never quite make it there, if that makes sense. So I think, I think yeah, a lot of my poems are, are kind of having to do with those kinds of feelings. Well, you've also lived on the mean streets of the Bronx and Lebanon, New Hampshire, ski town. So tell me how those locations influenced your writing. Yeah, Lebanon, New Hampshire is an interesting one. I moved out there in 2016. Uh, basically, I had a job that took me there and I worked, I lived and worked there for three years. And it was really different from any place I'd lived before. Um, it was more rural than any place I'd lived before. And while I, lived there, you know, I got to exploring, you know, some of the other towns in that area. And that was, that was really like a new experience for me. Um, yeah, it was just very, very different from any place I'd, any place I'd ever been. And uh, it, it, yeah, it was strange. I remember when I first took the job interview up there, one of the women who was, was interviewing me said, you know, this, you're, you're gonna, you're not gonna be ready for this. And this, and she had said, me, you know, there's no one who really looks like you up here, which isn't quite true, but I, I knew what she meant. It was, it was, it's, you know, it's, it's a different, it was it was different than like you know living in in New York City for example. 
yeah, I mean, all these places, I, I, I loved it up there. There's, there's a lot, there's a lot to love up there. You know, there's, there's great people, you know, really, really great, rich culture, good, good food. Um, yeah, so I've sort of absorbed that, taken some of that with me and then, right. So I'm, I, I live, you know, in New York now. I, I live, I kind of live on coming, I've come back and forth between New York and other places. And I'm back in New York now and I still work in the Bronx. So that's another place I love and totally, totally different place. But I, I think, yeah, it's, it's a different energy. And I like, I like having all those, all those energies and it keep, keeps me on my feet in my, in my writing and in my life. Is your poetry tougher when you're living in the Bronx? That's an interesting question. I, yeah, I feel like, I mean, it's more fast paced, right? I, I do feel like, I, I don't really, I didn't really think about it at the time. I guess some of my New Hampshire poems are maybe kind of more leisurely in pace than, than some of the, some of the, some of the poems in the city kind of take up that, that, that city rhythm, right? So, yeah. So, uh, Dick, poet Dick Westheimer asks you a question. Uh, you have some lovely surreal, mythic images. Does this tendency have any roots in your parents' experiences and stories? Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, yeah, but I've always loved, uh, yeah, myths and stories. You know, yeah, my parents and I, but yeah, have an, it, there's an interesting sort of triangulation between me and parents, my parents and, and stories, I guess. Um, yeah, like, uh, they, they would always tell me stories growing up, and then also we always had, had books in the house, like, from, from a very young age. I remember when I was very little, my my mom would, you know, would, you know, have me read a book and then like tell her what it was about. And like, I remember once, I think when I was very little, I was reading like Herod and the Purple Crayon. She's like, well, what's the storyline? I'm like, well, there isn't really, you know, like plots. Like that, that's ridiculous. All stories need to have plots. And I remember that, that was like an early, an early moment of friction between my, me and my mom, how we, how we understood stories. Um, I've always, yeah, I guess I've always been drawn to these kinds of like fantastical stories, whether they'd be coming from folklore, whether they'd be coming from literature somewhere else. Um, and yeah, I think some of, some of my stories come from, you know, you know, kind of folk stories my parents told me. Um, I think I inher inherited, you know, I, yeah, I inherited a lot of my relationship to, to story from my parents. I think me and my parents are both very super, we're both superstitious people. I remember, yeah, we wouldn't, my, you know, like, there'd be an hour after which we could talk about ghosts because it would just, you know, we, you just can't do that, you know, like, so I, I think like, I have a certain superstitious way of thinking about like ghosts and death and stuff I, that I got from my parents. But also I think some of the surrealism of my work also comes from Greek mythology and all, all, all kinds of other sources as well. Now I've just observed, I don't take this the wrong way. It seems yeah. to me that you can't get the words out fast enough. They're just coming and they're flowing out and you can't, you can't, get, is that the same with your writing? Like when you, when you sit down for a poem, can you not get it on paper fast enough? Um, that's interesting. Yeah, so it's actually, let me, let me pause to think about that. Um, I do talk very fast. That is true. Um, when I sit down to write, I think there's, even when I'm writing a draft, I think there's sort of almost perfectionist filter that comes into play. So I never quite write as fast as I think. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think different people are different ways. I, I don't know about you. I've, I've, I've always thought the me, the writing me, the me on paper, that's like the real me, right? And the me talking is some kind of like rough draft version of me that hasn't quite reached the level of pulse to convey what I really want to convey. I don't know. It, how, how is that for you? Because I, I know like when I just like, I'm like married lady with a kid now, but I remember back when I was like, you know, on the dating circuit, I, you know, like I'd always feel like those early stages when I was like writing messages, that was like, and I had time to think about it and make sure it really reflected how I felt that that was the real me. And then like the me stammering at the, you know, seeing a person at the restaurant was like someone trying to, trying to bring out the me, but not always quite getting it out. How, how, how do you, I mean, how do you, how do you feel about that? Yeah, I live my life like I'm constantly on a first date. <laughs> 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 Just never comfortable in my skin. Right, I, yeah. That's a You're great. Also line. A hmm? That's a great line. You're also a good. <laughs> so Jenna, you're also a physician. Uh, do you ever take the point of view of a physician in your writing, or are other physicians not in your discipline? I've always been resistant to that. Um, when I was in medical school, I remember people who were saying, you know, it, you know, I bet you're looking forward to when you'll be writing from the physician's point of view. But I've always, I always never quite. Like, and I, I remember like when somebody said that to me, I was immediately like, 
like something felt wrong about that. I guess, I, I guess, I, I want to write from the point of view of the of the, of the human being, right? Um, you know, with all the the facets that that entails. And I think that when you get into a certain kind of professional mindset, um, I, I think to be a physician, to go to work as a physician, sometimes you have to compartmentalize, and sometimes you have to kind of bring a certain kind of attention to to what you're doing. Like sometimes you have to, in order to really do the work, you have to kind of set certain emotions to the side. You have to, you know, focus. It, it, in, in order to be professional, in order to do the best work you can as a physician, and that's not necessarily what you want to do as a, as a poet, right? As a poet, you want to bring in everything that the the controversial and the, the strange and the the the, th the provocative, and you know, you know, as a, as a doctor, for example, you don't want to lie, right? But as a poet, you you lie all the time, it's, and so it's it's kind of <laughs> very very different ways of thinking, and so um, yeah, I've never. I mean, I, I guess I do write poems from a physician standpoint because I, inevitably, because I'm a physician, but I like to think that, you know, I'm really writing from the standpoint of a human being who has, you know, a multifaceted being, one of which is being a physician, but also, you know, you know, I've, I've also been a patient, you know, and I want to write as much from the point of view of a patient as from the point of view of a physician. I want to write from the point of view of, you know, a woman shopping at a supermarket. I want to write from, from all, from all those, from all the other points of view as well, so. That's, I guess that's something I have a conflicted relationship with in my writing. Well, your uh, book, Manate Manatee Lagoon, was described as really fo focusing on science, imagination, political awareness, and just humanity. So with that in your poetry, why do we think we get away from that in society? Uh, what, what do you mean you get, get away from that? I just wanna... Like, it doesn't doesn't seem like science and imagination and even like correctness is reinforced in society. So is it a poet's job to kind of reel people back into what I call reality? Or? Yeah, I guess, I guess it depends on what you mean by reality, right? Like, like I, I'm a, a fervent believer that poets lie and ha often have to lie, right? I mean, we have to bring the fictional, we have to bring in the imagination. Like, what what we do as poets is very different than what a journalist does writing an article, right? Like, uh, you know, we we want to make the best poem, and if that means saying the wall was purple and the wall was in fact white, you know, we we it's I, so. What, if I guess it depends on what you mean by reality. Like, I think like the the poet has a loyalty to truth, but that kind of truth isn't the same kind of truth as you know what a journalist deals with with the facts, right? It's also like the imaginative truth, the, the emotional truth, you know, the truth of the dream world. So. Um, yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's kind of what, I mean, it's, I don't want to prescribe what poets do, but, but to me, I, I yeah, I, I think the, the job of the poet is to, to be, to have fidelity to, to poetic truth, um, which is going to, in some ways, reflect, you know, the, the reality that we see with our eyes and our senses, but in some ways, it's going to be different as well. I mean, I, I don't think poetic truth can ever divorce itself from, like, you know, uh, Things that are happening in the news, right? I don't, I don't think it can ever wall itself off in this like ivory tower where you, you can't, where you're not acknowledging that you know Roe versus Wade was overturned and this and that. You know, all, all that is gonna, all that I think, I, I don't think it's, I don't think it's truth of a poet to see those things happening but not have any kind of relationship to those things. So I, I think, yeah, I, I think poetic truth is, is different than the reality we see day to day. But I think it, 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 it it's a constant conversation with that reality as well. That's a great answer. Um, you're going to be in the upcoming AWP. You're going to be on a panel called Reclaiming Meter. So who, who's on that panel with you? Yeah. And do you also feel that meter has come forgotten? Yeah, I'm, I'm excited. But it's, so the panel is actually pre-recorded, but uh, it's, it's a virtual panel. But I, I had a great time doing it. It's with uh, some of my very, very favorite poets. So uh, Annalena Phillips-Bell, who's an amazing poet. Um, wrote the, the book Ornament that came out a couple of years ago is on the panel. And Chad Abushnab um, is on the panel. He's an amazing poet. Um, uh, Alexis Sears, who I love, uh, was going to be on the panel, but then couldn't make it to, to our uh, recording. But another, another amazing poet. Um, all poets uh, who you know, write using meter in their work. But um, I guess, yeah. So we're, we're all poets who feel very fervently that you know, meter has something to bring to poetry that's not something that's old fashioned or that's, you know, that's something that's outdated that, you know, it's something that can breathe new life into, into contemporary poetry and is, you know, a useful tool for, you know, writing, 
poems about contemporary life from, from a contemporary standpoint. So we talk about that. We talk about, you know, works in, in the panel, we talk about uh, works of poetry we love that use meter. And, you know, meter isn't just your know, iambic pentameter that we, you see in like, you know, sonnets, you know, it's, you know, it's all, all kinds of things. There's sapphic meters, anapestic meters, all, all kinds of exciting things. So we're, we're all people who get weirdly uh, excited talking about meter. So that, that's what the panel is about. It's a big geek love fest. <laughs> yeah, which is wonderful. Yeah. So um, do you also, you've edited, you're, you're, you're an editor on the MacGuffin Journal of Medical Humanities. So let me ask you this. Which do you feel more like yourself when you're editing a book of poetry or when you're editing the MacGuffin? Uh, yeah, so I, I edit for a, the MacGuffin. I edit for a, a few different journals. I edit for a couple uh, medical themed journals like for Pulse uh, Voices from the Heart of Medicine and also for the Journal of Medical Humanities. And yeah, I think, I think the editing work is important to me. I think what I love about editing, right, is that you sit down with other editors and you talk about it, it, reading poems and you read a poem, you have an immediate you know, knee-jerk response to it, but then you're forced to sort of grapple with those feelings. You're, trying, you have, you're forced to articulate why, why the poem works for you and why the poem doesn't. And I think it's so important as a poet to, you know, do that, you know, frequently to, to sit down and try to explain why you think, you know, one poem is good and why another poem, you know, doesn't work for you in quite the same way. And, um, yeah, so I, the, the editing work, you know, always, I like doing it because it, it keeps a certain part of my brain agile in terms of, uh, in terms of I have to keep, I keep learning and relearning, you know, what, what, what I value most in poetry, like what, what makes a poem great in my mind, you know, and I, I think all those lessons I learned from editing about, you know, you know, what, what, what kind of strategies work in a poem, what kind of strategies don't, I mean, I, I, I ended up taking that back to my poet, to, to my poet self to my writing self. So yeah, the, the editing word's important to me. In the, in the end, I always feel like the writer self is like the real me, but I've always felt that, you know, like the me, like the me, you see me in the street, but that's that's one version of me. But I think the me that comes on paper in my poems is always gonna be like the, the, the real version of myself. I've always felt that way. All right, so um, you're stranded on a deserted island. You're also a very fine writer and painter. So you're stranded on a deserted island and you have this choice, and I just, I just love these. I call them bullshit questions. It will never happen. You have this choice that you can either write poetry for the rest of your life or paint or draw the rest of your life. Which one are you gonna pick? Um, that is really hard. Um, yeah. So I love visual art. I love drawing. And I love painting. Um, I don't think I'm particularly good at it. <laughs> um, yeah. When Part of the reason I think I was first drawn to become a poet, I think is like, I, when, when I was a kid, uh, like I, I think I mentioned, I grew up in a house where there's a lot of superstition and there's a lot of, I was constantly afraid of like, I would be hit by a truck the next day. I was constantly afraid that in the night, the house would burn down and we'd lose everything. I, I'm not sure, you know, I probably would benefit from some sort of psychoanalysis to explain why that's so, but part of the reason I became a poet is because poetry lasts, it, you know, even if your house burns down, you know, you can you have your, if you have all your poems on a floppy disk, you know, they're, they're all there, you know, they're, they're, pre, they, they're preserved in a way that you can never burn a poem down. It's always, you can never burn, a, it's like the Russian writer, so you can eat, manuscripts don't burn, right? So, yeah, so that, that's part of why I've always been drawn to poetry, first and foremost, right? You can't, you can't, you can't burn a manuscript, you know, it's, it's always going to last. If you're on a desert island, you know, and you put your poems, you're, you're, in a bottle, you know, someone's going to find them, but, you know, if there's like a typhoon, you know, all your, all your paintings, all your easels are gone. So I think I'd pick poems. Yeah. Didn't used to be that way. I think there's a famous story about the wife of a writer who just, you know, back in the old days, they got into a fight, she just threw the whole manuscript out the window. And I'm trying right. to remember who that was. But. Right, right. Now, now we have the cloud, right? So it's so, you know, it's, it's always, it's there, even if you don't want it to still exist, it'll always exist, you know. Bits and bytes. Dick Dick Westheimer is saying my is uh, pointing out my floppy disk reference. Yeah, no, no. I I, <laughs> I was obsessed with my floppy disks as a child. I thought I would carry them with me until I was like hundred years old. Now, of course, like they're they're useless. But yeah. <laughs> Spend a little time with you, and uh, here is the book Manatee Lagoon, and 
you can purchase it as you see from her website, uh, Jenna Lee Writing, and it's Lee with one E, writing.com. You want to find out more about Jenna and her work, you can get it on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, uh, University of Chicago Press. I would recommend that because that mm -hmm. generally helps. Uh, Jenna and the press out a little bit more than a purchase on Amazon and Barnes and Noble, but that's just my little commercial message. Um, so uh, thank you so much for uh, being with us. Thank you for this conversation and everything. All right, uh, the folks that are streaming on Facebook, I am going to now uh, disconnect you, but if you would like to come in and be on the open mic, please use the link and I will definitely let you in and welcome you in. And folks, next week, our feature will be um, Sarah Bridgens in New York City. So uh, come check it out. Jenna, wonderful to have you here. I just, I just saw Peter's screen, too. That's wonderful, Peter. Thank you. <laughs> oh, uh, hang on. Let's, uh, I'll have, uh, let's have Peter hold that up for a second. I've got to go to, let me, let me, give me a second to do a little technology here. And uh, let me let me spotlight. Can you all see that? Right? Okay, I, there it is. Oh yay! I love it. I love it so much. Thank you. Well, thank you very that much. That is wonderful, Peter. Thank you for that drawing. And uh, and mm -hmm. my hat looks like a comb over, so I like that. <laughs> <laughs> all right.